The discussion tonight is focused on how someone who is starting uh, a business or wants to serve the African businesses or someone who has a business, some of the things that they could rethink and or some of the things that they should consider when they are doing business. Uh, welcome to tonight's discussion on rethinking Africa business models. The discussion tonight is focused on how someone who is starting uh, a business or wants to serve the African businesses or someone who has a business, some of the things that they could rethink and or some of the things that they should consider when they are doing business. This, this is in view of several factors. So, for instance, it's the fact that uh, I'm quoting from a World Bank report about the informal economy in sub-Saharan Africa. So, uh, to begin there where they note that the informal economy is what within sub-Saharan Africa is one of the largest economies in the world, even if uh, the phrase informal economy has not been formally uh, or it has not been fully defined in the past. Uh, there is no standard definition, as IMF notes and has been noted by various scholars elsewhere, but it largely refers to the fact that it's the economy that is Comprises of economic activities that often are not registered. They circumvent, uh, like regulatory or compliance measures, administrative rules, which could cover business, uh, commercial business licensing, commercial licensing, labor contracts, financial, uh, financial systems, and social systems. So, noting that uh, within the sub-Saharan Africa and largely most of African countries, that this is the sort of economy which we would be terming for this discussion in formal economy, that is the biggest, then one asks, how would you rethink or how would you model your business within Africa? So tonight we have as our guest, Brian, who will introduce himself and he will be our main uh, panelist to cover a few of the points that we'll be discussing. There will be a series of discussions going forward. Uh, on this, and uh, we hope to cover exhaustively uh, different aspects that have to do with rethinking business bis- businesses within Africa. So, Brian, I'll let you introduce yourself, and then we will get started. Welcome. Thank you, Kristen. Um, my name is Brian Joko. I'm a business person as well as an enthusiast in African businesses. I've had uh, an exposure to both the uh, corporate world as well as startups and agribusiness, which I'm largely doing at the moment. Um, it's a very interesting discussion uh, to think about incubation and putting of uh, African businesses in perspective. And the discussion around having formalization for African businesses as one of the challenges that is facing African businesses and to bring us to the next level. I think uh, you give a very good preamble to the African problem in terms of business. Um, It's also been seen as a a curse, but I think it's sometimes also a blessing uh, in terms of the demographics that we see the African continent has. Um, For example, we have about 1 billion people, half of whom will be under the age of 25 by the year 2050. So largely Africa right now and in Africa of the future is an Africa of young people and so innovations need to happen in as far as doing business and uh, supporting African businesses, many of which are informal, needs to happen. So um, I will uh, mic back to you, um, Christine, to hold the next discussion points. Thank you. Okay, okay. Uh, thanks so much, Brian. And I think uh, just to introduce who we are, we are Africa Asia platform. We are a platform that we seek to have discussions around Africa business, Africa technology, uh, and Africa innovations, simply to share ideas across people from different African countries on issues that affect Africa. And uh, those are our main focus areas, business, trade, and and the digital economy. And the aim is just for someone who wants to start a business, let's say uh, you're in Nigeria, you want to go into Uganda or Rwanda or Kenya, then you need some information and you need to consider some of the things just to uh, develop your business or to have uh, digital innovations or any technology innovations, this is the platform we do that. And it's a great pleasure to have these discussions. And I think to begin with uh, tonight, to have Brian share his thoughts 
about what we've just introduced is, Brian, why do you think remodeling of African business structures is important? And I think just to start off by saying uh, the business structures is largely you could cover it from uh, the informal side or you could cover it from whichever angle you think is important that uh, for remodeling of African businesses, Brian. Thank you very much, Kristen, for the question. Yeah, so Kristen, uh, in a nutshell, what I was trying to lay across was the problem uh, that we have as uh, African businesses and the fact that uh, largely a lot of our businesses are in the informal sector. And I was also highlighting the fact that we have about 122 million new entrants annually into the job market of Africa, many of whom are actually going into the informal sector. And we are seeing statistics like about 80% of the total labor force contributing almost about 55% of sub-Saharan Africa's GDP. So it's an issue that uh, the framework and government policy needs to highlight in terms of formalizing and making it easy for the African businesses to survive. Yeah, I agree with what you're saying, uh, Brian. And, es- and I think a follow-up question that I would have on that is especially because when you consider that, uh, for instance, someone wants to serve like uh, within the the economy in an African country, let's say within Kenya. And then now you want to start a business where the people who are the biggest recipients of your services are people who are either not registered or they are people who whose the cost of just compliance is a lot. Let's say what you want to do is become a finance a financial advisor. So I think the, the focus of the discussion then is you as a person who is starting, it's to take cognizance first of the fact that a majority of the people you deal with will be such businesses. So when it comes to issues of like invoicing them or when it comes to issues of like uh, contracting with them, you start uh, asking yourself, how do I contract with someone who whose business as ideally I would do, I would require maybe a registration number, I would require this kind of things, but then they don't have this kind of documentation. And yet these are the biggest, the biggest percentage, as Brian has pointed out, of the market or consider someone who is uh, giving finance and and now uh, ideally you'd possibly need uh, security or some form of collateral to lend and then this is someone whose business is not even sufficient uh, sufficient to uh, be able to give you collateral so these are some of the considerations you are having so uh, Brian I think uh, you could also at this point also mention what are some of the challenges that African business businesses face in raising capital or expansion. This is also considering things like the youth and considering someone who wants to scale up in the circumstances that we've spoken about. Thank you, Kristen. Um, largely, of course, Africa's problem is Africa as, as, as a whole as well. So sometimes we are our own problem. Um, the reason I say this is because we need to appreciate and understand the landscape in which we're dealing with uh, to really contextualize doing business in Africa. And uh, for me, I think, first of all, the structures and strategies are largely around uh, fourfold. Number one is to focus on uh, processing and value addition um, because uh, over 80% of the value in the global food industry is in value-added components. For example, for the African case, it would be things like sorting, cleaning, packaging of fruits and vegetables and things like that. And so the opportunities, uh, especially for the informal and private sector, would be to expand these nature of activities into commercial activities and thereby uh, enabling them to access higher value markets, uh, especially both domestically now that we're talking about over 1.2 billion people uh, on the continent, and it's projected to be about 1.7 by 2030, and then uh, looking at the export market as well. Two is to think about uh, the fast-moving consumer goods for Africa by Africa, because if we provide market for our own you know, products and we are thinking about uh, the goods that will move from Kenya to Botswana to go to Uganda and then to Sudan, South Africa and Egypt, then we're tackling the, the, the issues of doing business in Africa. Um, Africa largely has what we call the bottom of the pyramid consumers. And the companies that have been successful in doing business in Africa focus and look at those consumers that are low income 
all middle income. Not, not to forget that majority of the people we classify as middle income status in Africa are actually considered as low income uh, in the entire world's landscape. So we have to look at uh, the export pyramid as well as uh, the markets that exist. And uh, what is most important, I think, is to create the business linkages that help the African entrepreneur and that business person that is in Namibia and wants to, uh, you know, start production. And I think the other thing also to possibly mention is the Africa Continental Free Trade Area uh, came, was launched from 1st of January 2021. And essentially, uh, the, the aim was to have more trade within Africa. And there has been, we've had discussions here on how much progress has been made. Like, for instance, could you say that there's increased trade between like Botswana and South Africa or as the trade volumes remain the same? And not even that, people who are not within the same regional community. So let's say uh, Kenya is within East Africa community. So there has been trade going on between, for instance, Kenya and Tanzania. So, but then how, how much trade has increased between Kenya and Angola, for instance, or how much has increased since the Africa continental free trade area? And I think, uh, I think Brian also, from what you're saying, uh, you know, like to focus on restructuring businesses in, in the way you say, like, uh, there needs to be value added to like the products that are traded within Africa. So I don't know what, what your perspective is on uh, a much common asked question on whether African countries have the ability to trade between themselves, uh, just as a follow-up to your, to, your, to your point. Because, you see, if all of us are producing goods that are not uh, have no value added, so let's say, for instance, it's a farmer who just gets uh, rice out of their farm, and that's, that's what every farmer within other African countries is doing. This is, you know, considering that they can farm. So is there ability for African countries to trade among themselves or what, what's your perspective on that? I, I believe personally, first of all, is even, even before we think about the export markets, is, is to build business linkages both internally and then we can scale that now to touch Africa as a whole and, and the world at large. Um, because um, if you're able to, let's say, get your goods from the garden and bring them to the market, uh, you already have a, a bit of business mechanism and feedback uh, to bench on right there within your backyard. So my thoughts are that uh, we need to tailor the solutions. And of course, this goes to policy and, and government interventions. But my thoughts are that uh, it is correct and possible that we build the business linkages that exist between the continents. But looking at harnessing, first of all, um, the opportunity costs that exist within uh, uh, doing business. For example, why would I produce peas if uh, uh, somebody in Malawi can produce better peas? So the, the business linkages should exist in the form of comparative advantages as well as the opportunities that exist for the particular products that we are to put out there to the world because uh, we need to be competitive and we need, we need to be able to see these businesses scalable to the African continent before we think about the world at large. Okay, uh, that's, that's very good perspectives. And to follow up on that, indeed, there are things that each African country is doing, which other countries are not doing. Uh, like you'll find, uh, like South Africa are great exporters of wine, uh, while there's uh, Nigeria as oil. And then you find, like, in the world market, you find Kenya exporting quite substantial amounts of coffee or even flowers. So there's already quite a bit of uh, different segments that countries seem to be doing w well in. But also then the other question is, you know, you know that's the supply side. So, so the supply side, each African yes. country is able to supply these different things. But the demand side, we seem to also be demanding the same thing. So if it's like food security, you'll find that possibly Kenya is struggling with food security to have enough food. Uganda possibly is doing the same, trying to get uh, food security. So for us to trade, you know, the, both the demand and the supply, need, there needs to be a match. So I don't know what to say about that because our problems seem similar. So if like there's drought and we, are all, we all don't have food, then we are all looking to buy food and then we can't supply to each other. So our demand may be different from even the what each other countries are supplying. And this, like, for instance, when I gave the example of coffee, 
uh, like coffee, Ethiopia is producing coffee, Kenya is producing coffee, and then how much demand for coffee is there within the African market? And also, for instance, flowers. So there are these countries that are, are pro great producers of flowers for the world market, but how much flowers are demanded within the within other African countries? So I, I don't know what your perspective is that on the demand side as well. Okay, first of all, um, we need to appreciate uh, the production capacities that we have as a continent because um, I do not think that we've had uh, quite a considerable um, investment, let alone structures, for mechanization of many of the processes in Africa to give us good enough uh, supply ability on the world scale. And largely the products that we're talking about, of course, are mainly agriculture, uh, for which, of course, Africa, uh, just like places like Brazil, which are mostly on the equator, experience very good climate, ETC, and this gives us again, a comparative advantage in production of some of these items, um, let alone some of the minerals that you'll find in places like the Congo. But my, my point here is that we need to have capacity uh, in terms of the production to actually match the demand that exists in the world order. And that comes from also, of course, scaling of our production, mechanization and uh, deployment of technology. For example, why should a place like Uganda, which probably has some of the most fertile soils in the world ever suffer from uh, a lack of food or drought. Um, if we can mechanize uh, the agriculture with all our rich soils, um, we share an, a mountain, for example, uh, Mount Elgon uh, on the Kenyan and Ugandan side. And the, the, the amount of coffee that comes out of there without a lot of work in terms of mechanization is just amazing. So we need to um, harness what we're able to achieve in terms of production capacity and scale so that uh, we can meet the demand with a considerable supply coming out of the operational readiness. Okay, I, I like what you say. Like, without much effort, Africa is able to produce a lot. So, because when you think about it, like, there's a the fertile soil, there's the minerals that are already there. It's almost like it's, it's already a land that gives. So, or a place that gives of just of its own, without much of mechanization uh, and without much of like innovation there's still quite a bit we get from very little effort that's put in it and so i think then i come to the next question especially now when you think about it one of the big drivers of the world economy right now is the is the tech and the knowledge economy where like it's not me it's not minerals it's not even farming it's that you can build an app for instance it's that you can come up with a technology solution is that you can come up with innovative ways of doing things. And I, I don't know, especially speaking from uh, from a perspective of your country, what would you like say are considerations that people should uh, take into account when looking for solutions? Like, is there a need for solutions? What kind of solutions? What push is needed to lean more towards the knowledge economy, the technology economy, and the more innovative side of things? Okay, um, just, just to answer this question quickly, um, uh, I would also want to uh, applaud uh, a lot of the developers and, you know, innovative young minds in Africa and largely in places like uh, Uganda and Kenya as well as South Africa and Egypt and Nigeria for where a lot of the innovations are happening in the tech world. Now, for me, um, my take is that uh, largely it's uh, the landscape. We, we need to give an enabling environment uh, for the innovative minds to actually do their thing. Um, so we've seen a lot of uh, innovations in a country like Uganda, which is uh, supposed to be in the third world, but we have uh, mobile payment systems, uh, health provision like Rocket Health, um, uh, and a lot of other innovative young startups especially coming through to develop solutions, um, but largely because of the environment and landscape that has been uh, and in terms of things like internet access, because majority of these actually start from uh, universities and uh, other institutions of learning. So for me, I think that for as long as you give an enabling environment, then innovation will always kick off. And we've seen it in Uganda, we've seen it in Kenya, we've seen it in other places on the African continent. So once we have the correct kind of um, incubation environment, then all these innovations and ideas will come to see the light of day. Okay, okay. And I think 
Brian, you could also speak about, uh, you've mentioned it a couple of times about incubation, like what the idea would be in incubation, even if in the past we've had a discussion here about uh, business incubators within Africa, but your perspective on why that's important and how it could be done and actually what it means. Like someone who is listening to this and is like, oh, if, if I wanted incubation done to my business, what would that entail? And then also you could generally just speak about the, the, the whole topic and just give your thoughts. And then we'll be taking if there'll be any questions after that. Right. Um, first of all, uh, thank you so much, Kristen, for the platform. Um, Africa I Share is an uh, an example of the incubation activities that can happen. And uh, from platforms like these, where we share ideas and thoughts on how to do business, how to tackle this uh, challenge ETC that is facing Africa, I think that uh, it creates a very nice springboard for anyone to, you know, try out something new. And it's the basis on which all ideas in the world are born. So my thought uh, that we have, we need to have enough support uh, the potential entrepreneur in terms of developing their business idea. And that's where the incubation comes from. So the support comes in terms of phases, networking, so that we are able to share ideas and, you know, come together, po possibly create link partnerships so that um, no nobody operates as an island because the issues that we're facing in Uganda could be the same issues that somebody is facing in Angola. In, in, in my life, you know. So at the end of the day, once we hold and have such platforms and uh, mechanisms of sharing our ideas, then it creates uh, an enabling environment for the entrepreneur, for the innovator, and the ideas to come to see the light of day. Thank you for that. Yeah, indeed, we have discussions whose uh, main aim, actually the platform, the main aim has been to just have uh, sharing of ideas and especially to uh, you know, someone who is starting a business, someone who is doing trade, to just get access to this information from other African countries, which you'd otherwise not have, you know. And you've also had a discussion which anyone can listen to on our YouTube channel on uh, business incubators within Africa and w how much people are raising seed capital or investment, and especially for countries like Nigeria, and how investors are coming in, whether it's venture capitalists or whether it's private equity funds to fund some of the projects. So, and I think at this point, we will, I don't think we will have any question, but tonight's discussion was really going to be an introduction. Uh, but then uh, the aim is that we'll be moving forward with this discussion in the coming week, where we will look at even some of the things that, that hinder uh, what we are speaking about. Things like, uh, maybe financing, like lack of enough financing or lack of support, financial support, uh, when you compare within Africa, for instance, and how easy it is to raise capital for a startup in Africa versus, you know, Europe or the US. It, it's quite an uphill task for someone who's starting a business within Africa. Uh, and there are very informal ways of, of getting capital, which at the end may not be sustainable. And then we'll also be looking at uh, the regulatory side, because you see sometimes uh, regulations within uh, within countries can completely even kill any business. Uh, so, for instance, when you think of tax regulations, for instance, registration requirements, licensing, when the costs are quite prohibitive, even as we are speaking about solutions that people could come up with. So you come up with a solution, but the cost of even in first implementing that solution financially then the cost of complying with the regulations, let's say even to run a machine, becomes prohibitive. So at the end, even as we are speaking about uh, how to rethink the business models, we are cognizant of these challenges. So, uh, Brian, I don't know if you have any uh, closing remarks. And then as we, we are coming to a close of tonight's uh, discussion. Right. I thank you so much, um, Christine, for the discussion. And I can't wait for the next series of the discussions to be held, uh, especially in the regard to some of the issues you've pointed out here in terms of uh, remodeling of the Africa's business landscape, as well as looking at some of the challenges and opportunities that exist. Uh, but also it would be important and nice to have uh, an overview to the regulation of uh, the businesses in Africa uh, uh, in general. I know it's mostly a legal framework issue and I know that uh, you have enough linkages to bring on board 
the people that will hold this discussion going forward. But my prayer, um, again, as a closing remark, is that we as Africans come together, learn each other, create business linkages, and uh, create a landscape that is going to take us to the next level. We are uh, I'm just going to use one word to the end, Ubuntu. Uh, thanks so much for that, Brian. I don't think there has been any question posted uh, as regards the discussion. Uh, in any case, anyone who has a question, uh, they can post it on our social media platforms. Uh, post all your questions and your comments there, which we'll be happy to address. Uh, so tonight's discussion was a bit short because the idea is to have a series of these discussions where we'll dive deeper into the issue of financing, as I've mentioned, and alternative solutions for financing, or what alternatives or innovative solutions could be made within different African businesses. And then also questions of regulation and generally the cost of doing business in Africa and how uh, someone can manage that cost. Uh, but as far as the discussion goes tonight, uh, thank you everyone who has tuned in, who will listen to this later on. It's goodbye from us for now.